is hypovolemic. And this is uh, chapter 39. So again, ignore any page numbers you may see on your slides. Um, you should be able to understand hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. The one that throws students is actually the more com is very very common as far as mortality. <laughs> It's the 13th leading cause of death in this septic shock. It is the number one diagnosis in the ICUs, is septic shock. They expect that trend to continue. Um, before it was gram negative, gram positive is now on the run with infection, and now we're even seeing these major fungal infections that are extremely hard to treat. So um, that one sometimes will throw students, okay? But shock is shock, meaning that this sustained. that a patient potentially could be in shock, also based on the obvious history, is the tachycardia, okay? That heart having to work hard to support either the loss of volume or the inadequate pump, meaning the heart, of course. So right now I'm I'm on hypovolemic cardiogenic. Okay. So <clears throat> again, this can result in multi-system organ failure which is a whole nother disaster, okay? Um, your first intervention is fluids, okay? I want 30 milliliters per kg. Uh, crystalloids are the preferred choice. Not the albumins, not the Hespan. Those have shown through research that that is not enhancing mortality. We want crystalloids. You guys know what crystalloids are, right? Okay. So, 30 milliliters per kg. Okay. So, you are infusing large amounts of fluid to restore volume and I know you're probably saying well you're going to put them in failure well if I don't get better perfusion they're going into failure anyway bottom line okay Because a body cannot survive without adequate volume. So with this, and again, you're in the shock state, again, this leading to multi-system failure. Okay. Fluids. Now, if this patient is not responsive to fluids, we're going to give a vasopressor. OK? 
okay? We're going to actually make this rise. And the best choice as of this day and age is norepi. A lot of you know it as levofed. A lot of ED nurses don't like it. We love it. We love it. Norepi. Epinephrine. You guys got that? Epinephrine. Try not to get my shortcuts. Epinephrine. Okay. Catecholamine, correct. Right? So if we want them, hopefully, to respond to those fluids, if I can get this pressure up, let's say with my patient who's in cardiogenic shock, then if I can get this up, then I can give other drips or devices. One is the intra-order. This is FYI, okay? You can actually put something in the descending aorta to decrease demand, okay? But fluids... If that patient does not respond, meaning that perfusion not being enhanced, we're going to have to put a vasopressor. Again, I don't care about your feet. I care about your brain, your heart, your lungs, and your kidneys right now. Okay? So I'm going to start a vasopressor. If at that time I still feel like they're not getting adequate perfusion, I will then start an inotrope. You guys know what an inotrope is? Increases the force of contractility. The best choice right now is dobutamine. So again, with this patient with cardiogenic shock, I don't want to have to run a lot of fluids. I really, obviously, don't want to do this, but I may have to. But this one I'm going to want for this patient. But shock is shock, guys. Multi-system organ failure is occurring. Which means I could lose the brain. They could drown, or not drown, but they could develop a problem with their pulmonary system. Acidosis. And they could lose their kidneys. And I can't afford that. Okay, you already got a dang heart problem. Or you've already... You're a trauma patient. I can't afford you to lose other organs. So that is what we're trying to do with our interventions. Okay? So, again, tacky. You're also, of course, with the history. Assess. You guys should now know how to assess this. Cardiovascular assessment. You were taught in first year how to assess volume loss. Get fluids going at 30 milliliters per kg. Crystalloids are fine. If they're not responding, start a drip, nor epinephrine. If they're not responding, meaning this is staying below 60, which tells me you're not getting blood flow to the kidneys, I'm going to start dope butamine. And if you don't turn around, you're probably going to die. If you don't turn around. And I won't go over this right now because y'all need a break. Now, I want to make sure you understand what is happening to that fluid. <laughs> okay? Because I know some of you are probably like, 
as I went over that with some students yesterday, but I want to make sure that you understand. Meaning that oftentimes this fluid is not going where it needs to be. And that just makes the whole situation worse. Like I said, you start blowing up like the Goodyear blimp as we're trying to save your life. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, and you can, I mean, and where are we going with this? You can see how this patient is going to be intubated. So we're going to the ventilator. And you're going to learn the key nursing implications of the patient on ventilator. Why? It's on the NCLEX test. Okay. So that is where we're going with all of this. Okay. Why? More and more patients are sicker and sicker and sicker. The acuities are higher and higher and higher. And these are the patients that you guys will care for. Okay. A lot of patients that are in the unit today are in the grave. And that's where we've come. This was predicted probably back when I had pigtails as a nurse. The, the docs would tell me, said, Susie, you're in a good place because it's only going to get worse. These people are getting sicker and sicker, and we're going to make them live longer and longer and longer, and they're going to have more and more and more problems. They were right. Okay, they were right. So, um, anyway, take a good break, okay? Take at least 15 minutes and uh, come back. Guys, if you'll go back to 111, okay, you remember we have the different intracellular, extracellular, right, I'm not going there. But the bottom line is this. You're, we are made... Uh, one, these larger <laughs> molecules, which come from like your what I always refer to as meat and potatoes when I taught 111. Um, you know your proteins, your uh, red cells, your blood, etc. Those large molecules have a higher pressure. Okay, and because that's a higher pressure, this is a lower pressure, that is what keeps fluid where it needs to be. And it's utilized by the body and then eliminated via the kidneys. Okay, now the problem becomes when um, you have a patient, not just with decreased uh, intake, um, you also have a patient what, that we're talking about with major increase in metabolic demands. And you also have decreased perfusion to the renal system. So now, instead of having this high value or the higher pressure, because of all of those factors, this pressure now becomes lower. And so now that fluid that is essential to be utilized by the vital organs is moving out in the periphery because, because now this pressure is higher than what it should be. So because of that, the fluid is moving out to the periphery, which is why you start blowing up, okay? Now, you may say, well, you're given all of these fluids. Well, I have got to fluids to support pressure. And vascular, t I mean, I've got to do that or you're going to die anyway, okay? So I'm giving fluids. Now, somebody said, well, Ms. Rommel, I've seen albumin given. Yes, you will see albumin given. You can give a concentrated 25% or the 5%. The physicians will order albumin to try and raise this pressure and pull some of that fluid back in. The physicians will... The current trend is hemoglobin 7 to 9. We're dropping. 
that is your target goal now, above 7 to 9. So if your hemoglobin is less than this, which very well could be with a trauma patient or a post-op uh, major bleed, then of course the physician is going to give packed red blood cells again to raise this pressure, not to mention in this situation providing oxygen to the vital tissues, but raising this pressure and pulling some of that fluid back in to where it can be utilized by the vital organs and hopefully your kidneys are going to start getting rid of some of that fluid. Okay, but that is why you see the fluid shifts or the fluid changes, which yes, this alone can affect the myocardium. Does that help you in understanding that concept? Because I know my first year students never got it. They were like, oh my, until they were able to see the full impact of the renal system and how the um, vital organs work together. Okay? So, again, you um, may see that. The best intervention is to feed within 24 to 48 hours. Give the body what it needs. Not to mention protecting the gut. If you leave that gut without food, it's going to start, that normal flora is going to start migrating. It's not what it's designed to do. Yes, it will migrate because it's meant to stay in that area. Okay, so tube feeding to support their nutritional status. We often have our nutritionists come in and look at the needs, what is going on. And those, a good nutritionist is a smart person. Okay, how to support their needs and not cause problems. So this is the best recommendation. However, many of physicians are still giving the albumins. Okay. So this is a much higher order concept. This is why um, fluid actually moves outward. When it does this, we call that, that's what's referred to as third spacing. Third spacing. And those of you in the critical care areas see that a lot. Okay. Third spacing. So even though you look like fluid volume excess, because your vascular, um, intravascular is not getting what it needs, you still need volume. So that's why, because a lot of times students are like, well, they're already blown up. Well, I don't care. It's not where I need it to be. Okay. So um, as we continue with our interventions, of course, we're hoping that we don't lose our kidneys. Right. We're monitoring the albumin levels to hopefully get that value up some to support their needs. Everybody got that? Sort of, kind of? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up what you have as far as a handout in regards to shock. And after we look at that, we're going to continue going to a situation where this patient um, becomes, I mean, remember, you got fluid in your lungs, you're laying there, 
you got all these uh, Indians and chiefs taking care of you. So what happens to these patients? What happens? You wait up. Huh? They get infected. The longer you stay in the hospital, the greater chance you're going to get infected, or you're going to start, uh, you you know, have a hospital acquired infection, which cost billions. Okay. So now we're going to look at this. to the vital organs. Identify early and treat early. It's critical to turn this around. Why is this such an issue? Because shot does have a high mortality rate. Okay, this is stuff we've gone over. Another problem we're going to get into as this person gets infected or they come in with a major infection, septic shock has high mortality. Okay? Um, and it is predicted to get worse. Just ignore page numbers. Now, you may say, when, how does this process evolve? You know, just like with the renal system. Okay. Basically, it's based on your map. Okay. So, the, the more this decreases and stays decreased, the worse your outcome is going to be. Okay, so if this is my situation, like I said, turn it around, turn it around now. Because as this continues and progresses downward, you have lack of perfusion, lack of oxygen, and your body goes into an anaerobic state. Not because. This is making my situation worse, right? So that is not where I want my patient to go. However, that's called early, early stage. If this patient is not cooperating, it will continue to drop, and that theoretically is referred to a non-progressive. As this continues, this whole situation is getting worse that we've talked about. Okay, in other words, my compensatory mechanisms to support the vital organs, they're failing. Okay, so again, it can affect the brain, the heart, the kidneys, and unfortunately, I don't really care right now because that's going to happen. A narrow pulse pressure, as your mean arterial pressure drops, that simply means your systolic and diastolic are coming closer and closer together. So again, if it's hypovolemia, volume. If it's cardiac, volume, and vasopressor, dobutamine, inotropes, whatever the case may be. So now we're continuing to a progressive. This is not good. Okay, we're now going to have, again, ischemic um, occurrences going on to my vital organs. And this is basically you're going down the tubes. 
as we're trying to turn this around. And I'm sitting there telling the docs, you gotta, we gotta do something else. We gotta do something else, okay? It's, this is not working. If you reach refractory, you're probably, again, this patient is gonna die. Um, again, meaning that our actions, you know, we may go up on perfusion, but then we go back down. Okay, this is the whole purpose of titration. Does everybody know what titrate means? Okay, because you cannot stay on IV nor epinephrine, which is a catecholamine. I mean, you can't stay on that forever and ever. One, you're going to lose your feet, right? As we keep clamping you down. But again, what happens is we try to titrate down, let's come off the norepi, and your pressure's falling. And once they fall, I have to go back up. And it's a continual nightmare trying to get these people off their drips. And it depends on the patient. The physicians are, may say, give them another 24 hours. Give them another 12 hours, Susie Keith. Trying to get them off. So it just depends on the patient and the situation. Um, unfortunately, if we can't get them off, then discussion with a family needs to occur. Discussion with families with these types of patients truly need to occur within 24, no later than 72 hours, because um, they need to understand the prognosis that they're not able to have their vital organs working um, without being on this medication, this drip, to support that. Um, and it's just, you know, it's very sad. This is why uh, your patients um, really need to have their advanced directives in order. This is where you get into the ethical situations of how long are we going to leave mom and daddy on the ventilator with these trips? You know, and we can have another four-hour discussion about ethics, but we're not going there. But you can see how this can be very problematic. And I always tell my students, yes, this could be your family, your loved one, and it's very hard to imagine. Um, it's even harder when it's a younger person like a 20-year-old that, and I've seen the, not, the worst nightmares you can ever see, you know, as far as um, DNR, rescind DNR, DNR, rescind DNR, because they are just so, they can't think. And it's really tough. It's really tough to know that, um, you know, try to, have those in order, but not everybody does, and um, that's just the way it is. Many of you, um, I know Kayla's seen it a lot. Um, we've had some horrible situations when we were in IMC last year um, that would have blown your mind, just blow your mind. Um, and it's just, it's very sad, it's very, very sad that this, these things can happen. Um, obviously, you guys should know that this is the priority. You bring that forth from last week. Uh, whether that be a mask to a BiPAP, even intubation if necessary, depending on the situation with the patient, okay? The recommendation is crystalloids. Treat this if it's needed to be treated. This is, you're going to see it but it truly is not the recommendation, theoretically, but you will see it used. These are now your big drugs to help support. Someone asked me about dopamine. In some situations, you will see uh, norepinephrine given and then dopamine as another used as a vasopressor, uh, but theoretically, the recommendation is norepinephrine and dobutamine. 
to help support the myocardium. Okay, this is a ton of material. Are you hanging on with me? Okay, for a lot of students, this is something most of my students have to go home, really think about and try and absorb, uh, get with a buddy or whatever the situation is. And with this compromised situation, this patient is likely to develop some type of infection. And or, you know, we have patients that come in with infection. Um, most of them, um, this one's on the lead, um, as well as fungal is out there. Other causes of shock is things you're going to be talking about next week. As you can see, in particular, burns and trauma. These patients with a significant burn easily go into shock. Okay? Okay? So, with that being said, you may be wondering, what is that top letter stand for? That's when you get an infectious process. Okay, stay with me. This is a little bit different. It and, and it is overwhelming your system, meaning your body. It results in a sy systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So I want you to think of this infection. This bug is all through your blood. Just a go in. Okay. Now, you think about when you have some type of bacteria crud growing. Think about the normal immune response. Okay, so your white cells could increase, your um, coagulation starts to occur, and all this stuff goes in to try and isolate that bacteria, right? Well, it's kind of hard to isolate when it's right? When it's just everywhere. It's all over, okay? And now I want you to think about your body is trying so hard to fight this infection. Did you know it can use up its white cells? It can use up its own platelets as these things are now growing. Okay? And that's a problem. The body doesn't know what to do. And that is called a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So, as this bacteria is invading your body, your temperature can go up or it can go down, depending on how the body and where it's at in its response. Your heart rate is obviously going to go up. Respirations are going to increase with this inflammatory response, and obviously you're going to start blowing off CO2. Your white count, up or down. Now, when this occurs, guys, what happens is your big fighters of your immune system can't produce enough to fight. So we start seeing a large number of immature neutrophils. This is called your bands. When you see that rise, that's called the left shift. You're in trouble. Okay? Because the body cannot keep up with those demands. I have actually, this is still in place. Two or more. Okay, they are now updating. And I will, I wrote it down. I may have to pull my book out. That'll probably, it's in my office, but hopefully I can 
So, this is what will identify this inflammatory response syndrome. Okay, you're in trouble. Okay, you've got at least a 60% chance now of dying. Okay, and again, the ICU is flooded with this. Okay. And Kayla, since you've been there, are you seeing more and more? She was saying the white blood cell count was 1.8. So they uh, were consuming everything, trying to fight that infection. Um, and that's unfortunate because, um, like I said, your chance of dying is very, very high. Again, as this response occurs, you can actually consume your clotting factors. So your um, platelets can result in thrombocytopenia. Okay? This cannot keep up with the demands. Okay. It cannot keep up with the demands, your stress response. Now this is where it can get a little tricky. As the body is trying to protect itself, these little bugs produce what is called pro-inflammatory cytokines. Don't worry about that. The point being, what are they doing? They are causing a massive vasodilation in your body, which is like a little bit of a problem. Okay, so they're causing this massive vasodilation from these bugs. Okay, and I'm trying to explain it the easiest I know. This is, I mean, I can go to the cellular level, but we've got to all understand it. Point being, what is it going to cause? Massive vasodilation. So now you think about it. The body's consuming up everything, and now I've got massive vasodilation. Where's my blood pressure? It's going in the toilet. My dang pressure's in the toilet. So as my pressure is in the toilet, you're just making it worse. <clears throat> this, these levels drop tremendously. Your cortisol. Body can't keep up with demands. Not to mention, you're building up lactic acid as all of this is occurring. So you can see, if you can sit there and say, you're going to die, you're right. You are going to die. Your chances of dying are very, very high. Okay. This is why, guys, in my day, you went to the doctor, you coughed a few times, and you're put on an antibiotic. Okay. My daughter has to be dying. Okay, to be put on an antibiotic because we have superbugs. Okay, bugs are going to outlive us, whether you like it or not. And, you know, now we have superbugs. And then we have patients who have no money and no insurance. So they sit at home with bugs and they can't afford to be treated. So by the time they get in the hospital, <laughs> you know, you're like, people don't realize how sick you are. I mean, you are sick. You know, your patient's in the nursing home. No one seemed to notice that 
got, you know, that Foley has been in there for God knows how many months, and the patient's electrolytes are all out of whack, and they're not peeing, and da-da-da. And they come in, and you're like, well, you are one hot mess, and you're going to die. You're going to die now. So it's a very bad situation, okay? And we see it a lot. We do. We see it a lot. So this is the critical component here, okay? So is that um, your body has gone crazy. It doesn't know what to do. So obviously... Uh, you're going to lose some organ function. Okay? Again, with the massive vasodilation, you will continue down the slope to severe sepsis where I can no longer support perfusion. This has actually changed. I look at the American Journal of Critical Care 2013. This is now 180. So we've gone up just a tad. The other change was at hemoglobin. It used to be like 8 to 10. Now we're going to 7 to 9. Why? Just FYI, because we're learning what too many blood infusions can do to the body blood transfusions can do the body. Okay. So um, this is now 180. Um, it's a mess. It's a mess. So with severe sepsis, your chances of getting out of the ICU are, are slim. Your kidneys are not working. Your platelets are so low. Your gut, what's well, dead, And, you know, okay, let me take a moment. I want you to think about you have consumed your platelets. Now, what does the body try to do? It tries to coagulate. Okay? But what happens is it's so ineffective, it only coagulates in the periphery. Okay? And because your platelets are less than 20,000 and your ability to now normally go through the coagulation cascade, it's not working either. So your ability to form clots can happen. Okay? So what happens? Well, then you're another mess that I have to try and fix. And that is called disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Often referred to by my new nurses as clot bleed. Clot bleed. Because your fibrin no longer works, it results in these little products called degradation products, and that results, FYI, in a test called the D-dimer, and the D-dimer will rise. Clinically, you are bleed, clot. Bleed, clot. I've seen people lose their toes or their foot if they survived. DIC. So that is what DIC. DIC is caused by an underlying problem. There are other causes, but we're looking at DIC in the situation of the patient that has septic shock. And this is what has occurred as the body does not know what to do to correct itself. This is false. This is from the massive vasodilation. 
that's just it's false. It means nothing. It, it, in fact, to me, it means you're you're headed toward the coffin right now. Okay. That's what I often one refer to as. Susie, how's your day? Well, we got one foot in the grave and the other one hanging out right now. I'm not very happy. Uh, because I'm going to lose this patient. And as they progress, they're going to go into the septic shock. And again, Signs, well, I'll show you in just a minute. But um, again, this is what's occurring. I'm losing organs. Multi-system organ failure. I've got disseminated intervascular coagulation going on. My body doesn't know what to do because it is so overwhelmed by bugs. So now I've got, you can see, just that alone, you can see how can anyone survive. Well, it's really um, identification and treatment. The current recommendation, if you can get these people treated aggressively within that first six hours, that is showing lower mortality. First things we're going to do, what's the first thing you do a shot? Fluids. 30 milliliters per kg. Okay? We're going to start doing labs. Serum lactate level. I want to know how much hyperperfusion is occurring to your tissues. If this level is greater than four, you've just bumped up your mortality. Okay, normal is like less than two. So if it's greater than four, we're in trouble. Blood cultures, two sites. I've got to know what you're growing. And, of course, initiating antibiotic therapy. So, we're aggressively doing this. Okay. For standing orders, I know if I don't, you don't respond to fluid, I'm going to go ahead and start a vasopressor. Many people have died. Back in my day, septic shot was an 80% mortality. It was pretty much your death Because this uh, diagnosis has become such a huge problem, or a huge um, event in this country, um, uh, the research has now uh, said we need to try and decrease this death rate. So now, most hospitals have what is called bundles. And again, if you'll think of like a protocol or algorithm, that is what we're talking about. So with this patient coming in, sepsis or septic shock, again, that's obviously on the high list. Crystalloids, I'm getting labs, I've got to maintain that mean. If they don't respond, I will initiate a vasopressor. Don't look at this right now. We ain't got a new yet. We're looking at mixed venous oxygen. Why? Because this is going to crump first. So if that's less than 70, that tells me tissue hypopoxia. So fluids, vasopressor, There it is, less than 180. These are the things, by these bundles, we are hoping to decrease mortality, okay? The big thing here, guys, is the fluids, the vasopressor, um, getting your blood cultures, administering your antibiotic. This stuff is still out for... I, they still don't know. I see different things. It, this low-dose... Uh, cortisol is still being used, but that's just, I don't FYI for you guys, okay, because I'm still seeing literature, current literature. I'm actually waiting for the current surviving sepsis bundle to come out. AACN is supposed to be putting that out soon. 
this is simply meaning that we used to give a drug to try and get the body to start clotting. This is released when you clot, protein C. So back when I was working with students in the ICU at Maine, we would actually hang this. This is a over a $10,000 drug that caused bleeding. But we did this, but based on mortality research, it did not decrease mortality, and with the expense, the recommendation was no longer to use this drug. That's just C-reactive protein, um, antibiotic therapy. I went over DIC. This just goes over what I said. It's what most of my new nurses say, bleed clot. Um, it increases your chances for mortality. Okay. This just gives the values. A lot of controversy now. Um, we're not doing a lot of this. We are giving platelets and packed red blood cells. This is still controversial. Um, and you may say, what in the world? What they're doing, guys, is they're trying to fool the body into quit consuming its clotting factors. That's what they're trying to do. You'll see a dot maybe order like reflutin. There's some newer ones out there. What they're trying to do is fool the body, quit consuming clotting factors. And they will administer not so much this now, but platelets and your blood. So this is the big problem with DIC is it does increase your um, mortality. Not using that. Here are the newer meds if you're just curious. Reflutin. I'm trying to front load you again. And then so tomorrow, what's tomorrow? Thursday, the day before the test. Okay, so tomorrow we'll start back with shock, right, leading into septic shock, talking about DIC, just basics, okay, and then looking at a patient with another problem that can occur, and that is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then tomorrow we can go over all of that, and then we can even go back to the previous stuff if needed and get in at that review time. And I don't know yet what I'm going to do as far as a tweet. I ain't figured out now. Um, so, hmm. what did you say, Jess? I don't have to yet. Well, I don't want to hear.